gentlemen, children of all ages. I got you. He got happy. He was ready for some elephants. <laughs> Those seven words are the most magical words in all of show business. And I had the honor for nearly two decades of saying those words on behalf of one of the most iconic institutions in American history. I am Jonathan Lee Iverson, the last ringmaster of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey. And as you can see, I also had the honor of wearing some really amazing attire. I was in an engagement once and it was really interesting. I must have been on my fourth or third or fourth costume change and I come running out, I'm trying to get a cue and I can hear these two ushers behind me and one, one of them says to the other, man, he's got more clothes than Cher. <laughs> I can't begin to tell you um, the rush I experienced. Um, knowing that when I said those seven words, that something special would occur. Night in and night out for over 450 shows a year, joy would explode throughout arenas across the United States of America and sometimes abroad at the sights, the sounds, and yes, smells that would burst forth in a cavalcade of what Ernest Hemingway once called a happy, a truly happy dream. So how did I end up in a place like that? A truly happy dream. The circus. After 20 years, I still wonder myself. But this I know. A journey is a peculiar thing. No matter how certain you are about where you're headed or how unsure you are about where you may be going, the journey you are, you're on, this life, is populated with all sorts of twists in turns, detours, roadblocks, you name it. And for many of us, they may present impediments or distractions. And in some cases, that's correct. But I've discovered that when it comes to detours, we may be presented with opportunities beyond anything we could ask or think. The circus was my detour. In no way did I plan it. Um, you know, uh, I never had dreams of running away and joining a big top. I was 22 and I was fresh out of college. The Hart School of Music, University of Hartford, here in New England. And there I was with contract in hand and I was a signature away from what I knew would be a life-changing decision. How exactly I couldn't tell you, because I knew nothing about the circus industry, nor did I know anything about what a ringmaster was or did. What I did know is that this was a tremendous opportunity that I had to take, no matter how certain I was about the journey I had chosen. Now, I remember I had decided that I was going to be an opera singer as early as 13 years old. And I remember where I was when I made that decision. I was in the Boys Choir of Harlem, and we were in Tokyo, Japan, on hand, for a special concert for President Ronald and First Lady Nancy Reagan. And I was sitting in our dressing room, and I heard a voice call out to me, and said, come here, I want you to hear what a real tenor sounds like. And so it was an older member from the choir and he wanted me to go over to watch the next performer who was being presented. And I remember the announcement because it was so cheesy, but this announcer was so proud of himself. And he says, and now ladies and gentlemen, Ronald and Nancy Reagan's favorite tenor, Mr. Placido Domingo. I had no idea who Placido Domingo was, despite the fact that he was a superstar in the world of opera. But when he began to sing, everything in me came to life. I had no idea the human voice could do that. In every way, I was spellbound. And when he finished singing, and when I eventually came to, I knew what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I had to be 
an opera singer. Now, unlike so many people who are enraptured by their own peculiar ambitions, I was actually ensconced in an environment that was really supportive of the journey I chose for myself, for the most part. My father, God rest his soul, never could wrap his head around me wanting to be an opera singer, and I never held it against him. Like most immigrant parents, he was practical. Singing is not work. And so we would have these very animated conversations on our road trips back to college. And I mean, he just would be grilling me over and over again. It was like being stuck in the West Indian version of the Inquisition. And he would just look at me with this grimace. And he'd just say, what you gonna do with a degree in do, re, mi? <laughs> so, uh, so you can just about imagine what that conversation was like when I told him, hey, I'm going to work for the circus. <laughs> On the other hand, there was the Boys Choir of Harlem. This place opened up a whole world of possibilities to me through the power, through the power of music and a world-class arts education. I was also a student at Fiorello H. LaGuardia High School of Music and Art and Performing Arts, the Fame School. It was so renowned that it inspired a motion picture and a television series. After graduating there, I went on scholarship to the Hart School of Music. So my trajectory couldn't have been more certain. I knew where I was headed. My journey was set, at least I thought. Like many of you, I invested heavenly into my journey. I planned, I strategized. I would visualize myself on the grandest stages in the world. I would just see myself there. I followed the map. I didn't have the luxury of a GPS to forecast the impediments and the detours that I might encounter. You just took the journey. Now, for many of us, um, some of us actually, we can deal with the reroutes and detours with stride, but for most of us, for most of us, um, we don't do change well. And that was me. It took a full two years during my time at Ringling Brothers in Barnum and Bailey to actually appreciate the opportunity. You see, my foray into the circus really wasn't about curiosity or the opportunity itself. It was fiscal. It was a means to an end. I fully intended to just raise money to go off to Europe and finish my studies in opera. I was so fixated with getting to the Metropolitan Opera that I could hardly enjoy a sellout crowd in Madison Square Garden. Intellectually, I knew my time with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey was really a great choice I had made. I just forgot to tell my heart about it. We um, aren't necessarily creatures of habit. I like to say we're stubborn. We have it fixed in our minds that we have to finish what we started, or we fear the unknown. And so we insist on the familiar because it promises us security. Let me break your heart. No matter what any insurance salesman ever tells you, there is no security. It's all a risk. You may be the captain of your own soul. Um, you may be in the driver's seat. But no matter how well you chart the course, no matter how meaningful the destination may be to you, you're not in control of the variables and elements that are going to arise during your journey. So give yourself permission to not be so certain. Don't get so locked into your journey that you actually block out potentially beneficial possibilities. My roommate, my college roommate and friend, Adam Newman, was a graphic design major. And unlike so many who graduate college, he actually found a career 
in the very thing he went to school for. And despite his success, he was restless. Adam was always open to new possibilities, especially when it came to the art of storytelling. I saw flashes of this when we were in school together. He would try his hand at about everything, um, anything from stand-up comedy to animated voiceover. Even while being a gamefully employed graphic designer. Eventually, he gave over to his nudge. And not knowing much about business or storytelling, he took his detour. And it's led to him having a successful, self-published, best-selling children's book series. Now, I'm not recommending that you flounder about and <laughs> hop upon every detour that tempts your curiosity. At all times, I would suggest you use discernment. What I'm simply here to remind you is we are on an evolutionary trajectory. Reroutes, change, detours, they're encoded into our DNA. We are literally ordained by nature to shift, change, recreate our entire reality, if need be, or as we see fit. Christina Cantlin was as secure in her career as anyone could ever hope to be. She was climbing the corporate ladder, she was making great money, she owned her own condominium, and an amazing collection of shoes. What more could a woman want? Now, according to her, she was perfectly content with her life, up until the time she walked past the Flying Trapeze School. Now, being the open-minded, liberal, Northeastern woman that she is, she thought, I'll give it a try. Well, by the end of that class, this corporate climber with the great condominium and the great shoes was well on her way to a detour. She said of the experience, it was the clearest moment of my life. I knew I had to do it, to the shock of everybody she knew. She went from a skyrocketing corporate career to soaring in the circus skies as a professional Jones, flying trapeze artist, had such one ambition, Circus wanted Vargas to be and a Cirque du Soleil. Now on these literal roads <laughs> Who can and highways and he byways saw, that so were, it's all he travel, knew. we don't have much say in the matter when it comes to rerouting or the detours we have to take. However, on our personal journey, Although I believe we always have a choice, life will sometimes strongly insist. Growing up in 1930s, growing up in the 1930s South Side, Chicago, a young Quincy Jones had one ambition. He wanted to be a gangster. Who could blame him? It's all he saw, so it's all he knew. One night, um, engaging in some criminal activity, he happened into a room with the intent of stealing its goods. Well, in that room sat a piano, and according to Jones, curiosity got the best of him. He went over to that piano, and he put his hands on it. And like that, he knew he didn't want to be a gangster anymore. He found his detour and he took it, and it has led to one of the most dynamic and prolific careers in American music and entertainment. It is possible to be relatively content and happy even with your station in life. But like Christina Cantlin, what if you knew you could fly? Would you take the detour? Some of us are deluded by circumstance. We've been convinced that we are too much of something or not enough of something else. But like Quincy Jones, if given the chance that you are something much more than other people's narratives or the situation around you or your circumstances, would you take the detour? 
I often wonder what would have happened to my life had I not taken my detour. Maybe I would be a successful opera singer, but I definitely would not be in history books, and I most definitely would not have been a question on Jeopardy twice. <laughs> I would not have the memories and experiences that are unique to me, and I would have never encountered the most important part of me, my family. I truly would have missed my entire life. You know, for eight years leading to the closing of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey, we traveled, played, and worked together. If not for that detour, I would not know the tremendous gratitude of having something worth missing. The journey that you're on is more dynamic than you could ever imagine, so I insist that you resist the fear of the unknown, that you reject, please reject, the illusion of control. Be daring enough to see new possibilities, new beginnings. The adventure is in the detour. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Jonathan Lee Iverson, your last ringmaster. And in the words of my friend and yours, legendary ad man, Jack Ryan, may all your days be circus days. Thank you.